let me welcome everybody during this breakout session. Uh, the topic of our meeting today is um, global uh, energy markets and the future of unconventional gas. It is not surprising that we're meeting here in Poland since uh, the shale gas, especially shale gas, is a hot issue here. Uh, so I think we're going to have a, quite an interesting heated debate. Uh, my name is Ernest Wyciszkiewicz. I work for the Polish Institute of International Affairs, where I lead the team dealing with energy and climate issues. And I'm very honored to, to moderate the panel, the discussion between very distinguished uh, experts uh, dealing with energy issues from uh, US and global and European perspectives. So let me introduce them briefly. Uh, the detailed bios you have in your paper, so I will just sketch it, sketch, say a few words. First of all, uh, Mrs. Lena Okolarska Bobinska, member of European Parliament. Uh, then uh, uh, Professor Friedbert uh, Pflüger, the uh, director of European Centre for Energy and Resource uh, Security. It's at King's College London. Uh, John Lyman uh, on the left, uh, Atlantic Council, director of Energy and Environment Programme. And last but not least, Frank Umbach, also from the Centre for Energy and Resource Security uh, uh, and as well as from the Centre for European Security Strategies. Uh, so, uh, since the, the, the idea behind this breakout session is uh, rather to have conversation than the speeches and, and, and academic, academic talk, so I will just have one minute introduction, then I will go to the floor to a set of, formulate a set of questions to our speakers and then we'll have the floor for, for, for the audience to, to, to Q&A session. Uh, a year ago, uh, the uh, chief economies of International Energy Agency mentioned that we are living in a period of unprecedented uncertainty with respect to energy markets. And probably he, he, he to some extent, was right. Uh, several factors decided that uh, that kind of um, uh, opinion emerged. Uh, this, first of all, price volatility of both oil and gas, uh, the politicization or securitization of energy issues, in the last, in the recent years, uh, the global economic crisis, which of course profoundly uh, influenced the situation on, on energy markets, uh, and of course insatiable emerging markets on the on, in Asia that still have a, a big influence on on the uh, energy global energy landscape. But last but not least, uh, a little bit out of the blue, uh, a new factor emerged uh, that uh, to to to, to very profoundly and significantly changed the debate about international energy, especially international gas markets, which is, of course, the unconventional gas resources, especially especially shale gas. Uh, it is unsurprising that uh, when we look at the U.S. Uh, uh, shale gas revolution that and its implication that the topic became a, a very uh, very hot issue and uh, uh, making even the, the experts from the international energy agencies say about the uh, uh, incoming golden age for gas. We'll see about it, but this is, how, this, this is the mood that we are experiencing right now. And uh, the, other, the other phrase that has been used about shale gas is the game changer. Uh, so uh, that the, this new factor effectively changed the rules of the game uh, on global uh, level, in influencing the, for instance, LNG market and prices. On on the U.S., this is obvious. Well, the U.S. becoming probably in uh, in the in the coming years an ex net exporter of gas from the importer. Uh, of course, the producers are uh, are more and more anxious about the possible impact of unconventional gas on their position, uh, and Europe, which a year ago was a cert, was in a kind of lethargy, but now uh, uh, the the debate becoming is becoming more and more interesting. And the French decision to ban hydraulic fracking is a obvious example that where are we going? That we, that this is that this will be a, a, a huge topic in, in in coming months and years. And especially the last thing, Poland, which um, at least for now seems to be the potential laboratory in Europe for shale gas. 
which uh, at least for now has been proven by estimates from various consulting companies and American uh, Department of Energy uh, that it seems to be that Polish potential deposits of, of shale gas are, one, are among the largest in Europe. So that's why the topic uh, on, in our country has become so important. So now let me, let me um, uh, formulate the, uh, the first set of questions or guess. Uh, uh, we decided to, uh, to start from the, from the beginning, I mean the origins of, this, of the whole thing and the US experience with that. So uh, my question is, goes to, to, to John Lyman and uh, is about, the, it seems that this revolution is not going to, to devour its children and it is going to stay with us for a long uh, time. Could you please tell us what is the situation right now in the US? What are the prospects? What are the challenges? Uh, where are you going right now with respect to the development of shale gas uh, potential? All right, well, there's been a lot written about this, and I think most of you have seen the writing. I think the, uh, it is not something that just happened overnight. It happened with a great deal of technological investment by the Department of Energy, uh, by the Gas Resource Institute, etc. And a lot of people think this is just happening as easy. Uh, I think what people have to realize is the complexity of the whole subject matter. This is not like conventionally drilling into a dome and simply producing gas in a conventional manner. You're going through some technological processes that take an incredible amount of, of combinations of technology, vast amounts of information, and highly skilled operatives to run. As we all know, the U.S. has been able to now have close to 25% or more of its total gas production is now what comes from unconventional gas. Is unconventional gas new? No, unconventional gas has been being produced for years, decades. It's usually been something called coal bed methane seams and tight gas. Hydraulic fracturing has been used for decades. That's not a new subject. What is new is the application of hydraulic fractioning in some new basins and in, with some new rocks to do some things that couldn't previously be done, which is to release, reduce, release the shale gas in, in much greater quantities. Uh, what does this take? Just to give you a feel, uh, in, the, in the Bartlett fields in uh, Texas that you hear about, Texas and Wyoming, there's 14,000 wells that have been drilled to, to bring that on in those fields. This is not a question of just drilling five or 10 wells. This is, a, it takes a vast enterprise. In the Marcellus Shell in Pennsylvania, uh, we've been drilling 1,000 wells in 2009. So you're talking about vast enterprises to pull this off, involving many operators many, and many different components. Uh, the U.S. is continuing to produce shale gas, will continue to produce shale gas. The net impact has been a dramatic drop in prices in the U.S. because we now have more gas being produced than, in fact, the market really seems to need. So the net result is that gas prices in the United States have dropped from, uh, at one point, almost $10, $10 in MCF. They're now down to 4 to $5, actually closer to 4 uh, the net result is we're no longer importing very much LNG. In fact, people are talking about possibly exporting LNG. Uh, so we've had a whole reversal of flows. The fast effect was that LNG no longer comes to the U.S. Instead, it's moving into Europe uh, to the benefit of the European markets, and it is moving into the Far East. Uh, Japan, as the nuclear uh, process is uh, breaking down a little bit, is, is actually going to be importing a lot of that gas as well in Japan. So we've had a, a shift in global gas markets that has been slow but is moving. Um, I think that you can continue the shale gas evolution in the United States, but we've just worked on a study with some patriots that are here uh, of what are the regulatory effects and what are the environmental effects of, of shale gas and trying to come to an understanding about what's really needed to happen. And I guess the simplest way to say it is that the technology has outrun the regulatory and the monitoring and the, and the, the state regulatory apparatus for enforcement 
of processes that will monitor this activity well. The U.S. industry recognizes that, and the U.S. industry is working to develop better operating practices, and we can speak to that if people are interested in that, because that is a major element of what also now needs to be done in Europe. Uh, it's, 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 it's a very complicated high technology process, just like we need to monitor and, and do things differently on shale gas. We have the same problem now facing us on nuclear, and we also know we have the same problems facing us on deep water drilling. So the fact is, energy, extracting energy is getting more complex, more expensive, requiring much different technologies than were applied 40 years ago when I started in the oil and gas business. And we are now uh, bearing the fruits of it. The U.S. is in a unique position in this regard. I think in Europe, we would argue Poland is the one country that has a similar process of having a big impact on its single economy. But we would not guess that shale gas will do in, for Europe as a whole what it has done for the U.S. There are other countries where it may have a major impact. I think I'll sign off with that. Well, thanks. Uh, still, there are a lot of ifs uh, in, the, in this uh, um, uh, and conditions um, in, in, in this presentation. And though the optimism prevailed, uh, still I'd like to turn to Professor um, uh, Flueger from the EU SERS, which has not long ago released a report on strategic implications of, of shale gas uh, development. Uh, so, how do you see the challenges related to the EU? What are the chances, as some say, of at least to some extent duplicating the US scenario here in the European ground? Well, well of course it is much different in Europe, but first of all, I would like to recognize that unconventional gas is generally, globally, a game changer. It is, according to Daniel Jürgen, the greatest energy innovation of the decade. And that is true globally. And we have to see now what is the potential in Europe and what from this potential realistically will become true in the foreseeable future. Of course, a number of energy companies, also the big IOCs uh, are engaging already in Europe. 40 companies, 10 countries. Uh, there is the attempt by the big companies to do what they have not done in the US and grab the momentum by land and start working. In the US, it were the small companies who were the driving force of the shale gas revolution. Uh, so. The European scape is, is very different because we have from the very first time companies like Exxon and Chevron who engage in Germany, uh, in Switzerland, of course very much so in Poland. The European Commission and the IEA believe that uh, the unconventional gas reserves, the recoverable reserves in Europe are between 33 and 38 TCM, trillion cubic meters. And in comparison, total conventional gas reserves in the EU amount just to 2.4 uh, trillion cubic meters. So you see that there is an enormous potential in Europe. And such sizable resources have the potential to reshape radically the European gas supply picture with shale gas playing a vital balancing role for regional gas markets and in any diversification strategy, uh, it can play an enormous role. And in general, gas has become more important after the Fukushima catastrophe. Uh, there is, a, at least in my country and Germany, a broad consensus within all parties that gas will play an important bridge to what is called the era of renewable energies. So gas in general is uh, getting momentum, and so there is room also for shale gas. On the other hand, there are a couple of factors which are different than in the US, and which make it much more difficult 
in Europe in general. First of all, concrete geological data and experience with shale gas is still in its infancy in Europe. Second, gaining the support of local residents for shale gas would be much more difficult in the European Union than in the US. Not only is Europe much more densely populated than in the United States, it is also impossible for many Europeans to reap some of the direct benefits enjoyed by their American counterparts. Local residents in the US can make impressive sums from shale gas by selling the mineral rights they own. Not so in Europe, where the land is most of the time state-owned and where the citizens are left many times with a trouble and only with very few benefits. Third, the environmental standards and the environmental awareness in the US, in, the, in Europe, is much higher than in the United States. And that could lead to particularly stiff opposition as we see it in France and in other countries. Uh, in, in connection with this, there are of course uh, lobby institutions and uh, uh, companies who try everything to prevent shale gas from becoming a force in Europe. Well, you can imagine that Gazprom has no particular interest that uh, this becomes a force in Europe. You can imagine that the nuclear industry in France is not very much interested uh, that uh, an alternative is developed in France. You can imagine that the renewable industry, which is quite powerful already in Germany, uh, has a big interest in, in, in that new source. So the resistance from from lobby groups is, is much higher. Another point, uh, European Union faces severe equipment shortages in comparison to the United States. We just do not have uh, the equipment to drill and to drill in, in that way which would really make in the foreseeable future shale gas a big factor. Water sourcing Local infrastructure might also present difficulties given the fact that the fracking process requires, as we all know, large amounts of water that may need to be transported in and subsequently removed for disposal. Fifth, labor costs in the European Union are higher, as are regulatory and environmental standards, slowing the development of shale gas and making it more costly. And this in combination with the European geology, where shale is generally deeper and hence more expensive to drill, will make shale gas economically probably less attractive than in the United States. So you see that there are a couple of, of problems and because of these problems are there, you can hardly see, with, perhaps with the exception of the Polish foreign minister, who I applaud for his leadership in that field. You, you do not see people in the political scene who take on that issue, promote it, put it into the political dialogue. Uh, and in my point of view, this is a pity. Not because I neglect the problems that I have just mentioned. They are there. But, you know, we, we live from a broad energy mix. We live from diversification. We live from exploring uh, alternatives and then see what we can do technologically in order to get cheaper production and uh, to compete on the market. And so it's, in my point of view, wrong to see this enormous revolution in the United States and say, well, we and Europe have, have a different landscape. We have, we have to deal with us, those problems, but in my point of view, we are able to deal with them and therefore Radek Sikorsky is right in uh, promoting this subject. Of course, it's a little bit easier for him in Poland than in Germany, because here the shale basins are, uh, by and large, in areas which are less populated, uh, and where you can also tell the rural uh, population, well, you have a, a great opportunity to make money. But nevertheless, I think we should learn from the Polish example and explore the whole thing. My last point, I believe, nevertheless, uh, taking into account all these uh, 
difficulties. Uh, shale gas is already a game changer in Europe. And that, uh, as a matter of fact, is, the, is, is one of the basic lines of that uh, study which we pre prepared uh, with, uh, with Frank Umbach and Maximilian Kuhn. Uh, this study says it is a game changer because it puts pressure on the Russians, for instance, on, on all suppliers, also on the LNG suppliers. They see that there is an alternative and that they can do on the price front not what they want to do, but that they have to, have to see uh, that there are different alternatives, not only LNG, not only Nabucco, but also shale gas uh, technology uh, from the United States uh, moving uh, towards Europe. And that in itself is already an enormous advantage of shale gas. Thanks. Thank you for this uh, realistic overview. Though I, um, I have two remarks maybe, uh, which I would like to raise now. Uh, the, the challenges that you have mentioned are pre pretty straightforward and, and well known. So my, my, my general point is, uh, Sh that since they are so huge and immense right now, I think that there is a there is a need for political will and political f and the engagement of polit policymakers here. And the general question is: uh, Should we Europe Europeanize the issue? Is it really in the interest of the shale gas industry to put the whole thing on the European level? Um, so I don't have an answer for it. Uh, but but because of the challenges, because of because of the tensions that are rising in various countries in the EU, I have some doubts that we need it. But maybe uh, 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 we find someone who thinks otherwise. The other question is that uh, the EU has uh, problems, I think, with dealing with novelties. And just last year, we uh, the Commission proposed the strategy to 2020. We have. Uh, thousands of pages uh, being published uh, about market issues, about climate policy, about supply policy, about emergency mechanism, and lots of other issues, in a, just in recent two years. And one or two sentences on the on, in the conclusions of the Council about unconventional gas, or unconventional resources even, as I remember. Um, so it, it's, it says a lot, and, and it's very telling, and it the question is how to interpret these things. Is it simply too new to be accommodated right now and we should wait a while for that kind of uh, inclusion of, 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 of new actor into the game? Or, uh, the, or the EU may, may, not, may be not prepared enough to do that because uh, if you look on, into the roadmap to, uh, 2050 which envisages actually removing fossils from, from the energy landscape to a large extent, and, and we have another fossil fuel right around the corner. What should, should, what should, what should we do with that? Should we uh, uh, evaluate or reevaluate re our strategies for mid-term and long-term strategies once again? So this is kind of general uh, problem that I, that I see. But still we are on the European ground, and uh, uh, I think that we should listen to, 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 to someone from from this, let's say, more optimistic part of the EU about shale gas potential, and, and how, how does those challenges uh, look from the p perspective of, of, of European Parliament and perspective of Polish um, uh, citizens? So I'd like to turn the voice to Mrs. Lena kolarska bowinska uh, Thank you very much. Uh, you said that shale gas is a rule changer. I would say shale gas will be a rule changer if we will be able to produce shale gas in an economically, physically way. Right now, I perceive shale gas as a big hope, which is waking enormous economic and political interests. Uh, we still, uh, there are too many question marks still connected uh, with the production, simply production of shale gas. We know that there is, but we don't know how economically physic feasible it will be, etc. So we are now uh, moving in the, in the world of, I would say, econo big economic and political uh, interests. 
This is, of course, not the case of the United States, but this is um, the, the reality in uh, Europe. So in that sense, uh, shell gas, it's a result of changing rules in Europe, changing energy policy in Europe. And first, um, to understand, I would say, what type of hopes and emotions evokes shell gas, we have to look that and to understand that energy policy it's um, merging, overlapping with many policies in Europe. First of all, with climate policy, it's becoming one type of policy more and more. Second, with the agricultural policy, energy policies, overlapping with agricultural policy. It's overlapping with foreign policy, and it's part of ge geopolitical policy of Europe when we talk about energy security. And third, um, energy policy is part of the I changing ideology in Europe. Left from right, it's not divided, differentiated um, on the pr traditional type of divisions. The questions of climate, of um, energy, renewables has become a basic right now part of ideology, political ideologies. So all these factors taking in consideration um, are influencing the debate and the developments in the, in the shell gas. So because we are because of all of them we are talking right now about, and question marks are about golden age of gas, because of the climate, uh, energy security, uh, I don't want, there is no time to develop that, more and more the gas becomes the crucial energy source in Europe, especially after Fukushima. Uh, this is why we observe all the interest being a play of interest in Europe around that. At the same time, uh, shell gas as the gas is the part of country energy mix. So the commission is saying like that, this is uh, not right now, not our business. We have environmental directives, environmental regulations, and these are crucial. But we are stepping from discussing, deciding, working on shell gas. I spoke with Commissioner Rettinger and they said that they are not preparing any documents for till this year and next year concerning shell gas itself. There are so many problems right now with CO2, energy efficiency, financing, infrastructure, that there are many other issues which are considered to be vital to European policy debate. Um, other than shell gas, which is the question mark. My impression is that also the Commission wants really to know how much shell gas there is and how effective will be its extraction to deal more with some uh, factors. What is crucial though, of course we have, all, as I mentioned, different political and uh, economic interests. Uh, recently, the, after France de declared a ban on certain technology of extraction, right now in the parliament, five uh, maps prepared a resolution against shell gas, demanding to stop any extraction of shell gas. Um, but I don't think that there will be many people who will sign that. We need hundreds of maps signing in order to be passed. We didn't manage to pass the pro shell gas resolution. I don't think the against shell gas resolution will be passed of the parliament. So from time to time we listen, we hear, but this is not con concreted as a vital thing. Although this is a part of politics at the level of governments. And this is interesting, maybe because the energy mix is a country politics. This is a part of uh, talks between Polish government and President Obama. This is a discussion between President Tusk and Prime Minister Tusk and Prime Minister Sarkozy. So it's part of, I would say, um, intergovernmental dialogue. The important thing, which I think fears in Poland and 
with this I want to and enter the internal policy. We all the hopes have now the I would say the other side of the mirror threats. We hope that shell gas will give us sovereignty from Russia. At the same time, more and more people are asking, among those corporations, how many are owned by this or other way but by Russian companies? How soon we will end up, as usually, as always, with Russians owning our concessions, our national treasures? So this is the same side of the picture. We will gain a lot as a country from shell gas profits as a country, taxes, concessions, etc. But how much we will lose because we haven't prepared ourselves well to, to ex defend our, I would say, national interests. It means to reach these profits and not let them go out of the country. We hear more and more of this type of threats. So uh, it's important. I would say to have a public diplomacy at the European level, even if we still don't know how much and how profitable will, will be the extraction of oil gas, public policy, diplomacy is inevitable. But it's also inevitable um, the construction and introduction in Poland of regulations which will convince our citizens that we are well defending Polish economy, I would say, interest in the sense of welcoming the um, investments, but at the same uh, sharing with them uh, profits, etc., etc. And today, uh, Prime Minister is meeting Prime Minister of Norway uh, in Gdańsk, and they will um, they both sign uh, intergovernment agreement on, cop on energy cooperation, and the crucial part of that will be the, the handing um, by Pr Prime Minister of Norway to Poland, uh, the example, description of um, the legal procedures which exist in Norway, uh, the taxes, uh, regulations, etc. So Poland can uh, look at them and, um, in, in, so, and introduce many of them in our country, as Norway has a big example of um, regulating its destruction on many uh, dimensions. Thank you. Thank you for putting uh, some light on, on the European um, uh, affairs and, uh, and uh, uh, putting Poland into this, in this context. Uh, still we heard that there are a lot of question marks and that's obvious. But now let's do a jump to more geostrategic level. How, uh, um, how shale gas, US shale gas revolution, and which actually has already, as Bob mentioned, spread out um, globally, uh, uh, how it, has it already influenced somehow geopolitics and geostrategies, and uh, what are the prospects of further um, um, uh, implications, consequences for, for China, for energy producers, and, and, and generally for, 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 um, um, uh, for geopolitics. And uh, Frank, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me firstly say something um, very general to the debate of shale gas, uh, because it reminds me very much um, to many other issues uh, we, uh, we, we are debating and how we debate uh, issues. And that has to do with my own experiences um, when I spent a lot of time, uh, also for a longer time in the US, but also working and living in, uh, living in Asia, in East Asia in the 1990s. And I just came back in February from, from two conferences in, uh, in South Korea and I made the same experience uh, um, in, uh, in, in East Asia again. And that's the experience we have a tendency here in Europe, if there is a new issue, if there is a new energy resource, if there is a new technology, we immediately start to begin and to focus our discussion on problems and objectives um, and we're quarreling so long about it um, that we're totally missing opportunities. Um, and um, so positive thinking uh, we can learn something from, from the U.S., certainly. Um, um, dynamism, um, dynamic, um, 
innovation thinking um, is quite different uh, in East Asia, where, you, where the people, governments focus on the potentials and the opportunities and grasping those opportunities and then later, of course, tackling also the problems uh, and the challenges um, linked with those issues. Um, and so the shale gas debate reminds me very much, and uh, that brings me also back uh, to what uh, James Jones said uh, this morning as one of the most important lessons um, when he was um, uh, working in the National Security um, Office. Uh, and that is very much we focusing in the shale, shale gas debate on tactics, not, not on the strategies. Uh, we are very bad, actually, um, very weak uh, in strategic thinking. Why am I saying that? Let me firstly begin with um, the geoeconomic implications it has. We are currently experiencing a so-called uh, global gas cloud. And then the global gas cloud has, of course, to do firstly with the impacts of the economic financial crisis since 2008, which decreased, uh, of course, the European uh, gas demand. It has to do, secondly, with an additional LNG supply increase over the last years, which will last at least until 2012, 2013. And then, in addition, you had um, the silent revolution of the um, hydro uh, fractioning um, technologies in the US, the silent revolution of shale gas. And that produced the global, uh, global gas oversupply. And that has already led um, to a delinkage of the oil of, of the gas price from the oil prices, something which most of our um, energy experts, economic experts, have demanded for years because they argued there is no longer, um, in contrast to previous times, no longer an economic justification for linking the gas prices to the oil price. And actually, that has happened, even in Europe, even in Europe, which is so much dependent on long-term contracts with Gazprom. Um, if you take German companies like E.ON Ruhrgas and Wintershell, which became under big pressure because they couldn't sell any longer the pipeline gas uh, during the last years as the times before. Um, confronted, of course, with the economic situation and the decreased um, gas demand in general. Um, so, um, German city uh, power plants uh, were able uh, to get uh, their gas supplies from those LNG um, supplies arriving in Great Britain because those ships couldn't get, go any longer to the United States. And you had spot prices over the night almost, spot prices of LNG which previously were much higher than pipeline prices where the spot prices of LNG were temporarily just one-third yeah, of the pipeline um, prices. Um, and that put uh, a lot of the European companies who have a strategic gas alliance with uh, Gazprom under a lot of pressure. And some of the pressure even went to the public. You could see that when Ian Rogas um, was blaming the situation, um, being dependent on uh, long-term contracts and long-term price regulations, um, which were not reflected any longer to the European gas markets. Um, and after those heated debates and, um, uh, of course, very different uh, um, uh, interests on both sides, um, Gazprom was forced already to reduce 15% of its pipeline volumes um, to the spot prices of LNG as a result um, of the silent revolution of, shale, of the shale gas revolution in the United States. Um, now, now it has to do with the situation um, that we indeed lack detailed um, assessments um, of the global availability and recover uh, availability of, of shale gas resources. Uh, that will take another two to five years. There are a lot of programs underway, also an EU program. Um, China and others are already on the way too. But there are some new uh, reports out, including from the Energy Information Administration, including from the International Energy Administration in Paris, from the IEA in Paris, 
Um, and they have concluded, um, and that's based rather on a, on a, on a, on a rather conservative assessment so far, um, and having not the full picture uh, on the global availability of unconventional gases, that anyway the availability um, and the finiteness of um, the availability of uh, conventional gas lasting to approximately 60 years, um, if you combine that with the presently assessed recoverable shale gas and other unconventional gas resources, has already expanded from that 60 years already to 250 years. Uh, and that's happening just with, within the last two years. Um, and that, of course, brings me then directly indeed to the geopolitical implications. I mentioned already Gazprom. Um, actually, it has very limited uh, opportunities. And that has to do that the rather cheap uh, gas fields um, it can still use are finishing. Um, the new gas fields um, Russia is developing um, are located um, in the high north, in Siberia, um, in the Barents Sea, if you take the Stockman um, uh, resources. Um, and those gas fields are extremely expensive uh, to develop. The development itself ranges up um, in Yamal up to at least 80 billion US dollars. Um, uh, or even more than 100, uh, as has been assessed uh, even by independent Russian uh, scholars. Um, in, in terms of Stockman, uh, 70, 80 uh, billion um, uh, dollars. So even if you, um, if you think upon, and, and I would agree with that as present assessment, that shale, the shale gas production in Europe might, um, the costs might certainly be higher than the US, even if you double the figure, it will be still much lower than the real cost of those developments of those extremely expensive gas fields in Siberia or in, in the high north. Uh, and that explains why Gazprom, as well as the Kremlin, of having always used gas dependencies, pipeline politics also as a foreign policy instrument, um, is extremely angered, is fearing, um, and, and uh, pushing um, um, uh, the, the, the problems in, in its media campaigns by, by arguing, well, uh, it will never be developed, uh, it will always be much more expensive, you have so many environmental problems, which is very persuasive if it comes by, from, from a Russian company, by the way. Um, uh, so um, that is fully understandable. If I would be a Russian um, an officer and working in Gazprom, I would certainly tell you the same. Uh, but it has nothing to do with the real picture. And that refers also to, to, the, to the lobbyism, to the vested interests you have, of course, by those European gas companies yeah, who, have no, who have never been in that kind of business, who don't have the technologies, who don't have the uh, management um, experiences and skills with, uh, those, um, with the shale gas uh, uh, businesses. Um, and you have, of course, in, in, in France, as we all know, um, the vested interests of the nuclear power industry, which has very close relations to um, uh, to the government, and um, they don't want to lose any kind of domestic shares of having a new domestic um, resource available. Uh, this is something which, of course, you need to, to know as, as a parliamentarian, uh, as you need to know um, sitting in a government um, and thinking about what your state interests are, which are not always the same um, of, of an individual um, um, energy company or sector. So that has a tremendous implication. I give you something uh, to, to other countries um, to highlight th that uh, kind of implications which we still, I think, underestimate what is really ongoing. So for me, um, I think the shale gas revolution is definitely underway globally. Um, it's not the question any longer whether a shale gas um, revolution will take place outside uh, of the United States. It will definitely. To which extent we can maybe discuss, but not the fact itself. And here other countries are pushing ahead in a much faster speed uh, than the Europeans. And of course, like always in these cases, um, at the forefront uh, it is China. Um, the preliminary assessments of China's unconventional gas resources are even bigger than the, U than the US ones. Um, they are even bigger 
than the conventional gas resources of Russia, which has the largest uh, conventional gas resources in the world. So the, Russian, uh, the Chinese government has pushing um, more than 6 billion US dollars, uh, meanwhile, into its companies and uh, the research and development processes of developing shale gas. Um, and for China, um, energy is always linked to energy security. And China is uh, uh, very much concerned about its rising dependencies on oil and gas LNG supplies via the sea lanes of communication through the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. Uh, and a major crisis can always be interrupted by the US Navy. Um, and therefore tries to diversify its energy mix as well as its imports. So if even a fraction of those unconventional gas resources in China becomes available, it will have immediately results on at the geopolitical, geoeconomic front. Uh, in its relations with Russia, Russia was hoping of diversifying its energy or its gas exports uh, to China. It has signed a, a number of gas contracts with China over the years, uh, but not any of those um, agreements had been implemented. And the reason for that is it could never agree on the gas prices, because Russia wanted to get the same gas prices uh, as it gets from the Europeans. China was never willing to pay that. Now it's in a st much stronger position, because that we have so many um, own uh, domestic unconventional gas resources available, why we should export extremely high expensive uh, conventional gas resources from, from, from Russia. Um, in uh, respect uh, to the Indian Ocean, if China is able to reduce its LNG, rising LNG imports from Africa, um, from uh, the Persian Gulf, it means reducing its energy dependence, um, reducing the possibility of interruption by the US in a major crisis. Uh, therefore, it may lead to a situation where China is much more comfortable in talking with the United States and the Europeans, for example, about much harsher sanctions vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Um, because the, its energy security policies are closely linked with, with the nuclear issues in Iran and, and etc. and the growing dependencies of China on Iran. Yeah? So um, it could give, go good on also with Ukraine, with probably having a large unconventional uh, gas resource. The United States has initiated a um, partnering program with Ukraine. And even the pro-Russian Ukrainian government is seeing the unconventional gas resources as a potential possibility to reduce its dependence on Russia at a time, again, when the present government is rather seen as a pro-Russian one. So with other words, um, we shouldn't lose that kind of, of global and strategic um, thinking and the potential we have um, here and not missing the train because if the Europeans jump on board, it not offers a new domestic resource uh, in enhancing its own um, uh, uh, energy security by also reducing dependence on Moscow. It even offers the potential for exports. And we may have problems with environmental regulations because it's much stricter. But that should be seen rather also in a positive way in contrast to the United States. We have much more experiences uh, with a much more stringent, uh, string, uh, much more severe um, environmental regulations. And that kind of management experiences of that kind of regulation bringing together with the US expertise and technologies could be even an advantage in exporting them uh, both uh, for other countries which will also face the same problems including the environmental ones. You know, so we, see, we need to see here the strategic potentials and not just focusing on problems. That is tactics what Mr. Jones, uh, General Jones was saying. Yeah? You have to think strategically uh, and you have to see also, and that's a historical lesson, if there is a new energy resource available at the beginning, those resources are increasing for drilling and production and never decrease. That's a historical lesson we see. And that has to do with technological innovation where we also just um, uh, having uh, just uh, seeing the, the starting of innovation taking place. Um, and the years ahead, uh, the new hydro 
uh, hydraulic fracturing technologies will certainly also be developed further with new innovations which uh, also take much more environmental concerns into uh, account, decreasing the chemicals, whatever you have. Um, so this is not the end of the story, this is just the beginning of the story. And therefore you need to have a long-term strategic outlook. Thank you. Thank you very much for this perspective. Uh, and thank you for this uh, comparison of, um, uh, let's say, attitudes between the EU and US. So we have optimism prevailing on the other side of the Atlantic and the quite of uh, pessimism or skepticism uh, ruling here. Uh, so it would be nice to hear, to, to see, uh, uh, to experience if this is a right uh, 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 right claim while I think with this time to go to the audience and we'll see uh, are are you going to be more focused on challenges or maybe chances so please the floor is yours uh, 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 let me let me uh, uh, oh yes there, sir there is a question Uh, my name is Bartosz Mieszkowski, I'm presenting European Center of uh, Geopolitical Analysis. And actually, I got two questions uh, for Ms. Lena kolarska Wominska. In the last days, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Donald Tusk, has been visiting France and he received a confirmation from Nicolas Sarkozy uh, about Polish uh, shell gas distribution that France will be uh, net neutral. Uh, taking into account this answer, how the e European Union will secure or participate uh, in Polish interests, which obviously, uh, in some extent, are Europe's interest. And a second question is to Mr. Frank Ambach. Shale gas in Poland is a big problem for uh, Gazprom uh, company and its interest in the European Union. Uh, one of the way to stop or hamper distribution is a danger, uh, dangerous uh, for environment. How Russia can disturb this process? Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, yes, sir. Please. My name is Tugev. I am with the Norwegian Atlantic uh, Council. Uh, it seems to me that one of the main differences between the United States embracing uh, an attitude to, to natural gas and the European is that in Europe we consider natural gas as part of the climate problem, while in the US it seems that they are now really embracing natural gas and shale gas as a solution to the climate problem. Because if you look to the latest roadmap that was produced uh, by the climate directorate in the EU uh, for 2050, it foresees a uh, reduction to 80 to 95 percent of CO2 emissions. Uh, and since this is total the climate gas emissions, that leaves virtually zero uh, for natural gas emissions. So not to the extent you use natural gas in Europe, then it has to be with carbon capture and storage. And that would lead to a totally different future for gas, including possible shale gas in Europe than in the United States. And so I'd like to hear the the views on this, particularly since also the Energy Directorate is going to put forward their uh, roadmap to 2050 by the fall in the middle of the Polish presidency. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions right now? So uh, I'm giving the floor to, to the participants, panelists, so who would like to answer maybe? Uh, the neutrality of President Sarkozy, what does it mean? Uh, you know, that shell, you mentioned that shell gas is Euro, sort of European, in the European interest. Uh, I had been participating in TV debate with um, uh, Rebecca Harms, the German um, Green Vice President of uh, Green um, Group in Parliament, and she said, why you Poles are developing the the two most dangerous harming uh, technologies in the you want to develop nuclear technology and shell gas the two most harming technologies and uh, so this is what uh, was i was trying to say that besides economic interests there are also some very strong political convictions 
And the decision of Angela Merkel to close was a very political decision, and she may win elections because of that. She may win. If she will not make that decision of closing, she will probably lose. This is what my colleagues from Germany are saying. So Europe is not perceiving shale gas as a, as a European issue. It's perceiving as part of energy mix. And when I propose to the commissioner a research study on shale gas, the answer was no, because this is an economic business of particular firms. So this is not only not European, but this is not only geopolitical, political, it's economic. Right now I applied for another project, <laughs> which, <laughs> so they say, if you want to get money, rephrase it and make it environmental impact of shale gas. So I said, oh, wait, let's see. So I rephrase it, uh, social dialogue at the local and European level concerning Shell gas, because I thought that we need simply European debate. I don't know if I would get money for that or not, but we will see. I'm just showing you these cases as this is treated just purely in this. And uh, your question on carbon capture, uh, you're right. Always when there is a crisis, and uh, at, after Fukushima we had a crisis, there are two answers. First, the green lobby says, let's invest in renewables, this is closing um, for closing nuclear plants. This is a renewable chance. But also, the um, coal lobby is saying, "Great, let's close the nuclear plants. We will invest in cl clean, you know, capture carbon storage, etc." And probably the battle will be going on on how to invest right now, not only in the greens. Um, energy, but also in the ca carbon capture, uh, because the, um, definitely the climate goals are being pushed up and up, and this is, uh, I would say, clear. Yes, um, how Russia can disturb the processes. Well, I already mentioned there is a media campaign um, which in almost every speech Mr. Miller and other representatives are giving, um, they pointing out uh, that the costs are too high um, of the environmental problems, uh, etc. So um, again, from a Russian point of view, I can can understand that, um, and of course um, it has implications for a number of other issues um, that has been mentioned. Uh, also by Professor Flüger, for example, to pipeline politics. Um, one of the strange um, things of these pipeline debates is that this debate on the, on the pipelines, Nabucco versus uh, South Stream or et cetera, um, is that it was totally, or is totally delinked from the question of the Euro what is the European gas demand in the future. And if you ask the question, um, so the industry uh, representatives will come up with figures which are going back to the year 2004, actually. Uh, at a time when the situation was completely different. At that time, um, we were not on the way of modernizing, um, uh, putting more efficient coal plants into the operation, not in Germany, but at least in some other European countries. That time um, we had um, a phasing out strategy on nuclear power, uh, which had then later been given up. Um, and uh, so far as I can see at the moment, it's only Germany and, and uh, which has phased out uh, its nuclear uh, power plants with, with a plan Switzerland, but I don't see any other country uh, following that. Uh, uh, referendum 16th in Italy. Well, yes, um, Italy, but even um, if you ask Greenpeace, it said, well, this is not a strategic decision, it's just a, t uh, a tactical decision by the government. Um, but beyond, I, I don't see that. that. That means, I can't see so far that the European gas demand will, will increase as a result uh, so much uh, from the Fukushima so far. Um, but uh, actually, we have a situation where the European gas demand is decreasing. 
Um, and that has to do with, with coal, with nuclear plants. Uh, it has to do uh, with the common European energy policy. In 2004, we didn't have a 2020 strategy. And at least one of the 20 percentage goals, uh, namely the expansion of renewables from 9 to 20 percent, is meanwhile seen uh, by the industry, the commission, and independent experts as very realistic, and we will probably pass that. So uh, actually, the energy demand in 2020 will go down, and as well as the gas demand out. That puts um, the pipeline politics um, and the various projects into a kind of competition. Uh, and here comes Gazprom into the game, because uh, if Gazprom is able, yeah, uh, to create another uh, fair company uh, with the South Stream pipeline, regardless of the cost, uh, and the cost will be at least three times what the Nabucco will cost. Um, but um, if it's able to do that, um, those gas imports will also be based on long-term contracts and extremely high gas prices. Yeah? And um, so if European uh, governments would agree with that kind of policy, so supporting uh, South Stream, of course they close a window of opportunity for shale gas as well as uh, for other um, alternatives. Yeah? So um, you should see that uh, strategy very, very clearly, uh, both on the side of Russia, you should see that very clearly on the side of those um, European companies, be it on, an, on the side of a nuclear sector, be it on traditional gas companies, and of course they, have, they are dependent on conventional gas imports uh, from Russia. And Russia puts a lot of pressure on those companies. Yeah, um, um, of not addressing these uh, shale gas issues um, uh, and um, putting pressure also on the price discussion, uh, etc. And you should you should see that very clearly, uh, and there should be an independent opinion on the side of the European Parliament as well as on the side of those governments and seeing the full picture and not following uh, any kind of media campaigns of individual um, uh, companies here. Fugger would like to react. Just a, just a brief comment. As much as the Russians, for the time being, uh, fight against shale gas with uh, lobbying and uh, well, all the measures that, uh, that Frank referred to, as much as they do that, they might be in the future forced to develop their own shale gas resources. Uh, because given that situation, with uh, LNG coming to Europe, LNG gas coming to Europe. Uh, by the year 2015, more than 100 billion cubic meters. With uh, Nabucco, uh, with, which brings uh, Caspian gas, perhaps Kurdish gas from northern Iraq, uh, perhaps at a certain stage Iranian gas uh, to Europe. Uh, well, the Russians have to rethink whether it makes sense to exploit uh, a field like Stockman in the Arctic. Uh, they could say that three or four years ago when they planned for uh, Stockman, because at that time they had an unquestioned monopoly. And even with these high costs, which Frank mentioned, they would have been able to push through, to set through their prices in Europe with this uh, competitiveness with shale and LNG and gas from other countries, they are in a different situation. And sooner or later, this new situation will force them to take gas uh, just like, uh, well, like a businessman who looks where is the cheapest way to get the gas that we want to export. Uh, so the effect uh, of uh, the perspective of shale gas, and I want to stick with my, my, uh, my thesis, is already a game changer, and not only a hope for the future. Yeah, I'd like to uh, jump in here, even though I'm American on the European situation. I, I agree with a lot of the discussion that's taken place on all sides, and I think what this reflects is the complexity of what we're looking at. We're looking at a time when energy prices are shifting, adjusting, and rebalancing for many, many different ways. 
we've got increases in conventional oil cost. To get an increased oil, we are going to be doing deep, deep sea drilling, which we know will have implications. We have serious efforts to produce oil now from shale. In the United States, what's happening is the, is the companies that have been drilling the gas wells for shale have decided that the prices are too low. There's an estimate that 50% of the current shale gas production in the United States is not making an adequate profit. So what are the companies doing? They do what they always do. They shift. The drilling rigs are still drilling in shale, but they've now moved down into the lower Texas and they've moved into other places up north, uh, and they're drilling for oil with the shale using the same fracking technologies. Uh, so the thing is, things will shift. Price levels will shift. Current, this will keep going on. I happen to agree that the situation we've been discussing strategically with the Russians is, is very interesting. I don't know that it's in the long-term interest of Europe to have the lush Russian gas industry go broke. I think you will very much benefit from continuing to have gas supplies from Russian, but maybe more on sort of WTO terms and on bundled terms than on Russian dictating terms. Right. And I think as you move down here, you, people talk about South Stream, and if it's three times more expensive than Nabucco, is Russia really gonna find it as interest to overinvest capital in a, in a gas pipeline, when in fact what can happen is shale gas can still be produced. Let's say in Poland, you can produce shale gas for, and I'll just make up a number, nine cents, then MCF, double what's being done for the US today. That puts a severe limit on long-term gas contracts coming out of Russia. So the Russians are gonna be, and who's gonna benefit from that? The companies that go in and invest in this. If they can, in fact, get the technological answers right, if they can do what they need to do to convince the public that they can safely produce it and put the right regulatory structures in place, not only at the country level, because it's probably gonna be at the country level it has to be done. Right now, the EU has enough directives in place to manage it from the EU level. The EU does not need to have more regulations at the EU level. Who needs to have the regulations structured are each individual country. And within each country, it has to be done at the local level. This is gonna end up being a decision for local communities and the oil companies and the gas companies that are doing this need, need to go in and convince the local populations that it's to their benefit to proceed ahead. But if they do that, they're gonna make a lot of money. They're gonna make a lot of money because the higher cost of imported energy, whether it be gas or oil, is going to create a tremendous opportunity for companies where they can find shale gas. So you're gonna find people with huge economic incentives to produce shale gas. And I don't know that it's in the best interest of any country that has that situation available to it to foreclose it. So I think the thing that, the, that has to be done in Europe is each individual country has to decide when and how they proceed. I think Poland is being very wise in saying, I'm not gonna forgo this opportunity, I'm gonna go for it, but they need to go for it wisely, although even in Poland, you may find local communities putting a stop to it. And I think that is a real danger. And by the way, that's a danger that we're wrestling with in the United States today. There are areas of the United States where there's a backlash. And the backlash is because we need better industrial processes. We need better monitoring and enforcement. We need better, we need better regulatory control. And this is not to be confused with the political debate over whether regulations are good or bad. This has got to do with the complexity of our modern technological processes that we're using to produce energy. And it's a problem for not only shale gas, it's a problem for deep drilling. Again, I repeat, we're in the middle of that debate right now on nuclear power. And that's what's going on right this week. There's a debate in Europe on this. It's a worldwide debate. And the answer is, we're gonna need all the power we can get. Don't forget whether you don't you don't think it's gonna be just done here. There are still two billion people in the world 
that don't have adequate energy. They're going to get that energy. And you may, we may have our debates here, but strategically, China is going to go for it. India is going for it. Indonesia's, Africa, the rest of the world is going to have to have it. It's, it's not going to stop. So now the question is, how do you do it wisely? Not whether or not it'll be done, and whether or not you're going to be part of the international global energy market or not. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, I do. Yes, uh, I just want to add that, um, of course, we are awakening, as we were saying, enormous economic and political interests. And, for example, South Stream has declared that they want very quickly to finish the southern line. And uh, the commissioner said that he cannot do nothing because this is an economic prospect supported by many southern countries. Italy, Greece, etc. So it's not only, and he said, I cannot intervene in a situation when uh, companies are making an investment. The question other is, if it's th this, uh, this inter in implementation of this project will be economically feasible, but definitely Russians are running now to speeding up their um, investment process of the South Stream in order to be quicker than the results of the shale gas. Uh, will be uh, known. But I just want to, uh, talking about geostrategy, we are talking only ab about Russia. But um, look how many American uh, companies has invested in Poland and thinking about that aspect in the context of our, of our co company, uh, conference. I just want to say that we have only very few American soldiers as a result of many years' negotiations, but we have now many, many American companies and American in economic interest being established here because of the shale gas. And this is also an important part of geopolitics and transatlantic relations. Okay, Frank. Um, very shortly. Um, you need also to, to, to see the shale gas um, uh, possibilities also in context of the EU policies of the liberalization of the gas market, which is underway. Uh, and if you combine bills, that would send a very strong, powerful uh, signal to Russia, yeah, because um, Russia has already lost market shares. Um, it's uh, confronted with the uh, unbundling processes, yeah. Um, and if you combine then and, and bring a new uh, gas resource uh, here into the game, yeah, then it will lead to the situation which Professor uh, Flüger was was hinting, yeah, that the present uh, Russian gas business model. Uh, and Sean was referring to that, um, can no longer maintain. Russia will definitely be forced uh, to change that. Um, and it's not possible uh, for Russia to any way to, to, to turn its head just to China, as I said, for also for the price uh, issues and the potential uh, China has for unconventional gas. So, um, so shale gas bec becomes the, the, uh, the, the last factor yeah, of, of an enabling uh, strategy to change this business model. And that would indeed offer, and I would stress that point, uh, what you said, John, that would indeed offer a completely different, a completely different energy partnership with Russia in the mid and long term. It would also help the reform processes inside Russia. Because as long as the gas prices are um, indexed to the oil price, as long as everything is based just on long-term uh, contracts, on very high prices, there is no incentives domestically in Russia yeah, to enforce a reform process in the energy sector. Um, with high subsidies um, uh, domestically, uh, which has implications for the entire economy. So, um, if you would stick to the present policies, overlook the strategic changes um, uh, shale gas offers, you're playing into the hands of monopolist uh, exporters and uh, those political and economic uh, forces inside Russia, which are not willing at all to, to reform uh, the Russian state. 
Uh, and if that is happening, it will fall on our feet just in 10 or 20 years when we have uh, then to deal with a Russia which is still not has not diversified its entire economy. And then we have to deal uh, with, with new economic social crisis inside Russia, uh, which are partly uh, our own responsibility uh, of not having supported the reform processes by using shale gas as an enabling factor uh, on our side. Thanks. Unfortunately, we have just uh, two or three minutes left, so uh, I can only round up a bit, though I wouldn't dare to, to sum up so many issues in uh, one or two sentences, so just a couple of remarks. Uh, certainly, uh, I'm convinced by the speakers that the shale gas has turned out to be a, a game changer on various levels. I mean, the, the global one, um, the, the, the regional one, though still we, we, we are worried that EU might miss the train as an as entity, because as, as I understand, since we don't have European energy policy, coherent European energy policy, it is still very difficult to speak about a shale as a game changer for the EU. We can speak about it as on the national levels, rather. Though, um, and the German decision on, on nuclear program shows very well that st we still live now in a world of, of separate energy policies of national governments, so I think we are far away from, from the uh, expected result. Nevertheless, it, it, uh, it doesn't have to be an obstacle to uh, developing the shape potential, potential in Europe, and Poland might be a, a case for that. Uh, so, and I, 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 I'd like to hear, I, I'd love to hear that, that we, we don't speak about any subsidies with respect to shale gas. Because when we speak about renewables, uh, when we speak about uh, uh, COA, I mean CCS, everyone then puts a button with subsidies, subsidies, public money. And I, 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 I prefer the approach that is connected to the, related to shale gas. Let's, and what Commissioner Ettinger said is great. Let's the business do the job. Let's just facilitate the conditions. Let, let, do not create any obstacles for them, uh, and and it will work, uh, and it will work probably faster than we expect right now. Uh, so, uh, just uh, the, qu the 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 question important for Poland um, is um, how long are we going to are, are we going to wait for for shale gas becoming. Uh, a, a local game changer here in the Central Europe, because from my perspective, we don't need much gas from shale deposits here to feel the difference, both psychologically, uh, which I think has already happened, because when we say gas today in Poland, we associate uh, it first with shale, not with Gazprom. So there was a certain revolution in thinking in, in Poland, that's, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, and, and of course, we still, the potential still must be proven, and we will have in September or October this year a first preliminary report of Polish geologists with cooperation with U.S. Geological Survey on Polish uh, deposits based on real test drillings, not just uh, estimates. So uh, uh, we will know some, a little bit more in, a, in, in the coming months. Uh, uh, nevertheless, to, to end up, I think that uh, to, radically, to radically change the, the energy landscape here on the local level in Poland and in Central Europe, we don't need uh, a, a 100 BCM a year. Actually, it is a question of, of 5 to 10 BCMs that, that will, would change here, the situation. The question is, which we, on which we don't have an answer, is it enough for the business? And is, is it an, enough for the industry? Uh, maybe they would prefer to, to have another gas, El Dorado, uh, uh, and instead of just that kind of production. Uh, so, but still, uh, I'm, ha I'm, I'm happy that we ended up on a quite optimistic note that we, there is a new actor in the game and which will uh, probably perform his role uh, and, and, uh, effectively in the coming years. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the speakers. Uh, I learned a lot. It was uh, an excellent discussion. And, uh, and thank you. I hope, actually, that you uh, uh, have the same feelings. And thank, thank you for, for, for participants for your uh, activity and for questions. Thanks. <laughs>